innumerable literary works, movies and television shows produced in the past century that allude to the Victorian era idolise the period. Exquisite dresses, wealthy homes and passionate romance characterise the age. But if we were to dig beneath the layers of silk and lace, we would uncover that the Victorians were in fact quite unhygienic. Bathing weekly was rare and for some even a daily wash was unheard of. It is therefore unsurprising that the Victorian era was plagued with frequent bouts of disease and furthermore women bore the brunt of peculiar trends in hygiene. So join me now as we embark on an enlightening journey and unravel the facade of the supposedly immaculate Victorians, albeit while holding our breath. And please like the video and consider subscribing for more historical stories. In the past, Victorians used various methods to clean their garments besides soap. For instance, when dealing with oil and grease stains, they often resorted to rubbing chalk into the fabric, whereas kerosene was known to be effective at removing grass and blood stains. Milk was a popular choice among Victorians to eliminate the odours and stains caused by urine, and they also used urine then to whiten their clothes since it contained ammonia. However, washing clothes 150 years ago was an arduous task that took hours to complete. The washing machine, a modern electric wonder, was widely available in the 1880s, yet even then the device was a far cry from today's current models, requiring a woman with strong arms to operate it all day. Many women avoided using the washing machine until the 20th century due to its tendency to rip clothes or leave rust marks. Moreover, the washing machine was only one aspect of the laundry process. The clothes had to be soaked, rinsed multiple times, boiled, starched, blued or bleached, wrung out, hung up to dry and ironed. As for unwashable clothes, it was a problem that needed to be solved. Washing, stated Mrs. Julia McNair Wright in her 1879 book, The Complete Home, an encyclopedia of domestic life and affairs, is a great burden and often a family bugbear. Her book went so far as to suggest that laundry was such a burden that clothes were often left unwashed for weeks, prompting her to recommend that women do their laundry every week. During the 1800s and early 1900s, tooth decay was an unpleasant reality that plagued people's lives. However, the only remedy available at the time was extraction. Those who suffered from toothache often found themselves in the hands of local barbers or blacksmiths, who also served as surgeons. Unfortunately, thousands died from the botched treatment, infections and other complications. In Britain, dentistry was a back alley nightmare for most of the 19th century, except of course for the middle and upper classes who could easily afford toothbrushes and toothpaste. However, most working class people had to concoct their toothpaste from materials such as soot, chalk or powdered cuttlefish. Toothbrushes of the time had abrasive bristles and wooden handles, and for those who couldn't afford a toothbrush, celery was believed to be a suitable alternative for cleaning teeth while eating. Although oral hygiene was minimal, dentistry was even worse. The Dentist Act was enacted in 1878, restricting the titles of dentist and dental surgeon to registered practitioners, and eventually this legal action brought a degree of order and professionalism to dentistry which had been sorely lacking for many years. During the 19th century, London was the capital of the world's most extensive and well-known empire, yet it was infamous for its horrendous conditions. The city was plagued with thick, sooty fogs that permeated the atmosphere, while the River Thames was contaminated with human waste. The streets themselves were perpetually coated in mud, and in the 1890s the city was home to around 300,000 horses, producing a staggering 1,000 tons of dung every day. To address the issue, the Victorians resorted to enlisting young boys, aged 12 to 14, to dart between moving traffic and rapidly scoop up the animal excrement from the street. Even though the first public lavatories were erected at the Great Exhibition in Hyde Park in 1851, 
The early indoor water closets presented numerous amenities that preceded indoor plumbing. As a result, human waste was frequently dumped into large cesspools in buildings' basements, and although this seemed like an ideal alternative to unsanitary chamber pots or outhouses, these cesspools ultimately reached their capacity, and their putrid odours often permeated the living spaces above. Consequently, the practice of night soil men arose, representing a cottage industry responsible for emptying cesspools and selling the waste to farmers as fertiliser. But as per the laws of the time, emptying cesspools could only occur during the night time, as the task was deemed too disturbing to undertake during daylight hours. Innovations in plumbing have revolutionised people's approach towards personal hygiene, significantly reducing unpleasant odours. So a round of applause for the marvellous invention of indoor plumbing and sewage systems. During the early stages of the Victorian period, the primary purpose of bathing was to achieve therapeutic benefits. Sponge baths were all the rage, and cleaning your face, feet, armpits and intimate areas once daily sufficed. However, taking a bath for your entire body every day was deemed a terrible idea. When full body bathing became more common publications that provided Victorians with explicit details about what to expect during the experience were circulated. One book even presented a collection of toilet recipes for the curious uninitiated. Like the urban myth of swimming, people were warned against bathing for four hours after a substantial meal. Victorian citizens were advised against washing their faces when travelling, unless they could sanitise the water with alcohol or ammonia beforehand. But one of the most popular beauty treatments suggested was the Russian bath, which entailed washing your face with boiling and then icy water. All this to stave off wrinkles. In the 1930s, commercial shampoo ushered in a new era that changed the world. However, this development raises an intriguing question. What did people use before shampoo? Did they rely solely on water, soap or some other substance? Well, during the Victorian era, the streets were flooded with thousands of doctors who extolled the health benefits of bathing to the masses. The Victorians were renowned for their fascination with novel industrial products and health crazes. Although washing hair with lye, a highly concentrated solution of potassium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide, remained a widespread practice. A challenge emerged in the form of the unassuming egg. Women would crack several eggs over their head approximately once a month, work up the slimy egg into a lather in their hair and then rinse it. While the Victorians were obsessed with hair, modern shampoo was still a far off notion. Diluted vinegar was another popular option for hair washing. Numerous other cooking related products were commonly used as hair washing alternatives before shampoo's advent. Rosemary, black tea and rum were also suitable substances for cleansing hair. During the Victorian era, the concept of foul odours was not merely unpleasant, but believed to be hazardous. The miasma theory often called night air claimed that various illnesses, such as chlamydia and cholera, could be transmitted by our unclean air. The Victorians attributed the poor health condition in London's impoverished areas to the street stenches, and not even the esteemed nurse Florence Nightingale was immune to the influence of the miasma theory. She believed that clean air was crucial for patient recovery. The lack of sanitation in industrial areas led to diseases, which resulted in unpleasant smells. Modern medicine and sanitation practices have since been discredited, though even modern cities may have a distinct scent during the summer, nothing compares to the disgusting odour that once plagued London in 1858. The River Thames, which is now picturesque, used to be the city's sewage system, and its citizens would dispose of their waste in the river. The Londoners' grievances regarding the river's putrid smell were not unfounded, as physicians attributed it to the spread of diseases across the city, and the summer of 1858 will always be remembered as the Great Stink. Only when the unpleasant smells wafted towards Parliament from the River Thames did lawmakers take action. Within 18 days, a bill was passed to establish a modern sewage system, 
in London. In the era of Queen Victoria, women's clothing was accused of being the culprit behind the rampant spread of tuberculosis. According to medical professionals, the extended skirts that dragged on the ground acted as carriers of the disease and consequently women unknowingly carried the bacteria into their homes. Of course, it's the constrictive undergarments that were mandatory for women to wear were also accused of being responsible for the spread of tuberculosis. It was because corsets compressed the lungs, making breathing difficult for the wearer. To mitigate the ailment's proliferation, women's attire transformed, with higher hemlines and less restrictive corsets being adopted. The prevalence of sexually transmitted diseases, or STDs, was high. Though frowned upon, escort work was a common occupation for women in the impoverished areas of London. As contraceptives were not easily accessible, sex workers frequently transmitted STDs to their clients, who then went on to infect their wives. In due course, the outbreak of STDs became a public health crisis, which the government eventually addressed. Female escorts were apprehended and subjected to compulsory medical treatment, whereas their male counterparts faced minimal or no repercussions. During contemporary times, we are equipped with a vast array of amenities to suit our every need. Our homes have dependable heating systems and indoor plumbing to facilitate our daily hygiene. Nonetheless, our forebears were not as fortunate. In the Victorian age, individuals who occupied the lower rungs of the social ladder seldom took baths. The poverty that many families were engulfed in during the 19th century prevented them from making progress and left them with conditions that were akin to the gloomy and obscure era of the Dark Ages. No regulations were dictating what constituted a basic home. As the Victorian era approached its end and Queen Victoria passed away in 1901, however their perceptions of hygiene still differed significantly from ours today. Thank you so much for watching the video, it's really much appreciated. And don't forget to support the channel by subscribing and I'll see you on the next one.